Because feeling fast is as fun as being fast. Right. Because it's not really fast by any modern definition. No. But it's a pleasant exhaust note, at least to me it is. Yeah. Uh, the engine sounds like it's working. It gives effort while seeing effortless, if that right. makes any sense. Yep. So, I mean, you put your foot in it and you, you know, you enjoy watching the tack move across. And your red line is almost 7 grams. It's about 68. Welcome to the episode of Jay Leno's Garage, the car featuring today, 1991 Oldsmobile Calais. Okay, okay, but before you turn away, let me finish. Very rare car, very high performance car. In fact, most car guys don't even know about this. A lot of GM guys never even knew about this program. It's pretty fascinating. This is the engine here. You'll learn about this in a minute, but did I get your attention? Looks pretty cool, doesn't it? This is a, uh, what they call a quad 442 W41 package. Uh, they only built uh, about 200 of these. Um, it's a fascinating story. I didn't know anything about these cars until I ran to this gentleman, Jeff Safranek. Jeff, come on in, my friend. Good to see you. Thanks for bringing us today. Oh, no trouble at all. You know, I, I, I always like to learn new stuff. And as much as you think you know, there's always some stuff you don't know. Sure. And I was certainly involved in automobiles in the 90s. And I probably heard about this, but didn't really give it its due. So tell us what we have here. So this engine here is basically uh, General Motors experimental engine from mid 80s. Um, GM teamed up with two engineering firms, Fueling and Batten Engineering. Um, this engine is from Fueling Engineering. Um, they ba basically were building whatever they could for General Motors Aerotech project. Right, I remember um, that. Yep, and uh, so the two companies built several engines. Um, I believe Fueling Engineering is the one that won, won out. Um, this particular one was a two liter twin turbo made about 1170 horsepower and this um, is 1991 this is 1985 this wow. is before the cars even wow. were thought on paper in 1987 gm took the they had a long tail and short tail version of the aerotech um took them with driver aj foyt to a test track down right. texas aj right. foyt set a uh closed closed the course land speed record about 268 miles per hour I don't know if this is the exact engine, but an engine identical to this. There's right. two on display at the R.E. Olds Museum in Michigan, um, and this is the only other one that I know of that's in private hands. So it's a two-valve? It's four-valve per cylinder. Oh, it is four-valve um, Yes, per it's four-valve per cylinder. Okay. This is a two-liter D-stroke version, okay. um, twin turbo. It just seems so un-Oldsmobile. I mean, it doesn't <laughs> seem like when you always think of Oldsmobile, well, you think of the big, you know, the big V8s and everything. And it's such a unique package. And it almost looks like something designed in the 30s by Leo Goosen and, and Offenhauser you, and all those guys. You know, right, it definitely has a... Harry the, Miller the, and all. Yeah. The factory production engine definitely has a offy look to it. Yeah. Um, but uh, like, again, this one was completely experimental and they, they just wanted to go out and show exactly what they could do with what they had at the time. I love the fact that the alternator is driven by the water pump you got water and electricity together. Right, it's, yes, that's, that's a great that's, idea. The English have tried that, yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's really cool. So what was the idea? They had to homologate this, what, the engine was was too powerful, they thought, well, it's not a production engine, they tried to shut them down? So so the Calais was produced 1985, 1991. Right. Um, about 1986, 1987, you had uh, two, two brothers, um, Paul and Carl Hacker, um, they're out of Albany, New York, they were Big Volkswagen road course racers. Right. Um, General Motors approached them and said, hey, do you want to drive Oldsmobiles? And uh, they just went out with these, you know, basically in-house only built engines um, that just dominated the two liter to three liter classes at the time. Right. And as time went on, SCCA stepped in and said, you know, this engine's not available to the public. You can't, you can't do this anymore. So in comes the W41 package for 1991. GM produces um, 200 examples, 15 of which received the RPO code C41. Um, they were designated non-air conditioning cars. They also got an engine oil cooler set up. They were supposed to be strictly for the race teams to build and race, right. um, just to meet SCCA's homologation rule. Now, did this not get a lot of publicity back in the day? I mean, there's a lot going on in my Surpri life. So surprisingly, there, the Calais, you could get a, an S model, an SL model, and then you could get a W40 model, which featured the high output version of this engine at 180 horsepower, um, and then the very limited production of the W41 engine, which was 190 horsepower. Um, you got a special geared transmission with this, as well as um, a little bit different suspension on this car versus the W40. So this one got a little more road coursing tweaks to it 
For manual transmission. Man, all 200 were manual transmission. Five speed, four five, speed? Five speed. Okay. Yeah, because it, it didn't seem like, you know, I think we still had V8 in our heads in the early 90s. It was the idea of why would you get a small engine when you can get a big engine for the same price. I mean, they tried that with Pontiac. They did the overhead cam six for a while, and they made right. a performance version. By the time you paid for the performance version, you could have had a V8. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. People think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Right. And, and, and so the idea of an Oldsmobile with a two-liter four-cylinder engine, then I'm like, what? It, I think to most people, you think of an Oldsmobile as, you know. Right. Right. Yeah, they, they advertise these as not, not your father's Oldsmobile. Right. And they were, you know, GM was trying to go for a younger generation at the time um, for sales. Um, but Was for, it a tough sell, selling the 200? From what informa little information is out there, yeah. all 200 were produced in the month of March right. in 1991. This car was actually sold to its race team early 1992. So they, they sat on lots, I think. Not that because they were a tough sell, it's because nobody knew about them. Right. You'd go and you'd see the automatic model and it was $2,000 less because it wasn't a performance package. You're probably buying that instead. Right, okay. I probably knew about it at the time. I'm sure this is on the cover of I think I saw this engine on the cover of Hot Rod magazine. I, I have that in my mind. This, part this particular engine, the the R and D and the Aerotech project, that in my eyes got a lot more publicity right, than the actual than right. the actual what came of it. Yeah, because it just seemed incongruous. To those, why is Oldsmobile playing with a four cylinder? <laughs> it, you know, it just seemed weird. You know. Right. But uh, it's a great looking motor. I have to admit, just from the sculptured form of it, it looks it looks performance. I love this bag of snakes head is here. <laughs> I mean, this, this is this Yeah, the, cool. the production engine, once you get under the hood, um, looks a lot different than this, right. but it shares the offy look right. um, with, the, with the cam covers and whatnot, so. A gear driven, chain driven, belt driven? What so do this here? engine is belt driven. Okay. The production engine is timing chain driven with hydraulic tension. Yeah, because they good luck finding a belt for this. Yeah. Oh yeah, and and you're talking a thousand horsepower difference between the RD engine and a the thousand 100, horsepower difference. Eleven seventy to one hundred ninety. So that wasn't on pump gas, was it? Um, I I don't. They, Probably race the fuel. The details are really right, really, really black and black out on a lot of the things for this particular okay. project. So this is the one we're going to drive today. Yep. Okay. Well, I think this is just fascinating. Uh, it just looks so unassuming sitting here. Do you surprise people at stoplights with this thing? <laughs> with the way cars are today, it's, it's uh, you know, back in the day you could go to the drag strip with one of these and probably take on a five liter Mustang, no problem. Right. Um, but today everybody hides everything. Right. Can have, you, everybody has a sleeper, so it's, uh, it's definitely a looker. Um, it's definitely not the fastest thing I've ever driven, but right. definitely gets and goes. Okay, can we open the hood and see what yeah. the production engine Absolutely. looks like? From inside? Yep. Oh, so it's transverse, of course. Yep. It's, it's front, front wheel, wheel drive, drive. correct. It's front wheel drive, yeah. Correct. I remember the first time my, my dad and I looked at cars. My dad said to the salesman, Why is the engine transverse? Guy, we get more power, more power transverse. <laughs> He goes, well, how does that work? You know, just, it just guys, salesmen just like know what he's talking about. Yeah. But you do lose a certain, you do lose a certain amount. Right. Today, by today's standards, it's about if you, if it were an automatic, you lose about twenty five percent through right. the driveline. Manual, seventeen percent. Right. Yeah. 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 It was in line, of course, and it'd have to be further back. Correct. And, and you'd have, have a lot of, trunks, less trunk yeah, space. You need to pump for rear floor end and all right. that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 Okay, fascinating. And about 190 horse, which is pretty good for a 1990. For 91, it was one of the, one of the top performers GM had out um, for 91 mile a year. It, it surprised a lot of people when they put it out. You know, it, there's a lot of magazine articles out there um, that, that just show how ridiculous this thing was at the time. Yeah, because uh, I remember you mentioned the comparison to the Fox bodied Mustang. We had one of the highway patrol cars here. <laughs> And it was a V8 with a little two barrel, mm -hmm. and it was, not, you know, you thought, you used to have the, you know, the Mustang that chases Porsches or something. And right. They, they ran the ad for it, and you go, right. well, I don't know what you're chasing. Maybe a 1948 <laughs> Grumman car with 35 <laughs> horsepower. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to catch anybody in this thing. So this really would have been uh, certainly the equal of anything was available. Right. Once you, once you got into the 80s and, and the big three started to get choked out by emissions, right. um, you know, four cylinder was the way to go. You could do 
a lot more with a lot less. Yeah, and this yeah. Is, this is a proof of okay, it. Okay, what else is here that's different? No, well, nothing. It's pretty standard. I mean, they they cover the. I, I miss seeing the. I like seeing the twin. Uh, twin. Yep. Twin yep. cam covers. They were. The, it's a IDI cover. It's totally integrated. Um, two coil packs with the. Uh, plug boots, um, so there's no plug wires, there's obviously no distributor, no cap or anything like that to go bad. I kind of expected a bar a bracing across the front <laughs> here, but now going from shock tower to shock tower, but I guess they didn't feel These things were, necessary. yeah, these things were pretty rigid. Um, a lot of the a lot of the race teams did, did brace a lot. There's a lot different bracing in the race cars, obviously. Yeah. Because I think in 90 or 91, certainly the late 80s, uh, the mid-range Oldsmobile was the best-selling car in America. Right. It was big, had four doors, had a V8, and it was the most popular car you could get. Nobody predicted it would be out of business within 20 a, years, a decade or so, a little <laughs> right. over. Yeah, I mean, it just goes to show you, you never know. Yep. All right, well, very cool, very nice. All right, let's, yeah, let's put this down sure. again. Can we open the hood on the racing version? Yeah, absolutely. You know, this looks pretty production to me. It doesn't look that all different under the hood. Is it mostly internals? Is that what we're, we're... Right, so basic differences um, between the street version versus what GM produced for the race teams to build. These, as you can see, has a lack of air conditioning components. Right. Um, they added in a oil cooler uh, system for the engine, and um, it's rumored that they got baffled gas tanks, but not confirmed, and uh, they are noticeably a little lighter because they didn't get any sound deadening material in the floor versus a streetcar that has it. Right. Um, all of them had ABS, but these had tunable ABS computers for different tracks. They could set, you know, front more brake, rear more brake, but they were doing it electronically instead of with a, a bias adjuster. And those computers are like the size of a suitcase back <laughs> in the day, weren't they? So the ABS computer is here. Um, oh, that's and not they, too bad. They could, they could tune that through the OBD2 port. Right. Um, and then the ECM. Um, for the engine is up under the dashboard on the passenger side um, and they actually had data logging um, technology for these things floppy floppy disk drives right um, where they could go and test run these things go back to what of a computer they had at the time and look at that and change fuel maps yeah because OBD didn't become mandatory until 96 right so, so your OBD yeah. one is in GM vehicles as early as 1984, I believe. That'd be OBD zero. This car is OBD, what they consider OBD one, which is about 1988 to 1995. Right. 1996 would be OBD two, which is what they're currently phasing out now. So. Yeah, but 96 is the first year mandatory. Every car had to do Correct. it. Correct. You had to plug in. Yep. Okay, very cool. Now, what are these parts you got over here? So these engines may look the same on the outside, but internally they're completely different animals. This one in particular is near about 240 horsepower. Wow. Um, reason for that, um, it's got a Kellogg forged lightweight crankshaft in it, um, as well as some jet titanium rods. They're about 100 grams less than a factory rod. You free up that rotating mass. I mean, that factory rod looks like something from the 1940s. It just it right. Seems Technology good. hasn't changed right, too much. Right. Don't reinvent the wheel. Okay. Um, but the jet rod is obviously much lighter, much stronger. Um, and then, as I said, they had data logging capabilities. Um, that's basically what the engine computer was. This was, this particular one was from GM R and D that uh, they would they would trade um, files because um, it's just a removable EEPROM chip in there right. um, back and forth to uh, try and improve on it. Um, what, a crank like that to make today would cost you what, 15 grand, 20 oh, grand? Oh, I, I would assume in the neighborhood of, of that yeah. for sure. I, I'm sure they weren't much cheaper back then either. Yeah, yeah. Because it's all just machine work, isn't it? You're just, no counterweights on it, right? Nope. Um, so that that is the basic difference. So on a factory crank, um, the timing trigger wheel here is actually a full cast um, gotcha. counterweight. And what are those all factory books? So these are actually the two original log books for this car. Um, okay. This car was raced from uh, about the middle of 1992 on. Um, the previous owner that I purchased it from was racing it up until 2009. Just the idea that you're using books as opposed to <laughs> putting it in a computer, you know, something you'd have, I mean, just, 
It seems like they see that gear approved. Look at that. Yep. Yeah, that, that's about all those books are for, for safety. Occasionally they'll they'll drill a small hole in the cage to make sure the pipe thickness is correct. Um, you know, make sure you're not unsafely racing. Right, right, I think you can see it's all, all stamped, different races. Oh, that's kind of, that's yeah. a cool piece of, of uh, Thank you. kit to go with mm -hmm. it there. Very nice. Well, let's, uh, can we take this one for a ride? Absolutely. Let's see what it's like, and we'll shut this thing down here. Here we go. This one's not street legal, but this one is. Come on, let's take it for a ride. <laughs> sure. Oh, crush velour. I remember the <laughs> 90s. Smooth. Surprisingly, they were notorious for how harsh the engine ran. Well, the best thing you can do with a little car is drive it, you know? Right, sitting is the worst thing. Oh, I know. <laughs> that goes pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it's got some. Yeah, it's got some pickup. Some pep, as my dad would say. <laughs> That's why the Racers like these things. The power band was like 2,800 up the red line. And it's fun because it's not crazy horsepower. It doesn't overpower the car. Right. It doesn't overpower the chassis. You get to use all of it. Discs in front, drums in back. Is that what it is? Yep. So the race version didn't have four-wheel discs. Huh? So the race version has um, the standard set up in the front. Right. It's got oversized aluminum drums in the rear. Oh, yeah. Well, they were famous for Buick and Oldsmobile had those great aluminum brake yep. drums, I remember, back in the day. Yep. This was, 91 was the first year GM started to implement their ABS on these things, and uh, they just did, they did so much tuning with the race car, with the yeah. race teams um, to get them to handle, you know. This is always the era that weird fabric stuff, <laughs> you know. This, right. This, Everything is... Everything's not quite plastic, but not quite leather. Yeah, yeah, it's that, like pleather, you know, yep. yeah, it's like, yeah. Transmission's nice. Yep, it's clo close ratio, uh, 394 final drive. The race car is a little more difficult to drive. It's got a torsion limit slip differential in it. Yeah. Um, so that grips a lot harder, it's actually, Pretty difficult to turn, and I'm I really question how those guys got them around road courses yeah. back in the day. But well, I remember Ford on the early Shelby's had the Detroit locker rear end. Right, you go you go around a corner, you just chirp the tire. Yeah, it's like you're breaking a guy's neck. <laughs> I hit crack. What was uh, I, I? I broke a tooth. I, you know? Oh, no, I guess. Oh, I guess not. <laughs> you know, it, but just all the time. Right. But they were pretty bulletproof, weren't they? They didn't break. No. You know, it's a shame they didn't make like a fastback coupe or some kind of special, because this could have challenged a lot of the imports at the time. Right, you know? so they, they there was a two-door, four-door model available. You could get this in a four-door. Um, the concepts of these in like 1984, 1985, they had a, a two-door um, wagon back, kind of like a Civic hatchback style thing. Right. Um, obviously, that never never met fruition. It's but that's how they advertised these things because they were putting out better horsepower than they had the Hondas or the Toyotas that they right. had at the time. Um, you know, the, the race teams, a couple of the a couple of the points sheets that I have from the end of the year where these things were winning the championships, the first, second, and third were these things, and then the closest thing they could touch them were turbo MR2s. Yeah. So. I know, but once you lose your reputation, it takes a long time to get it back. <laughs> You know, right. I mean, they glided for so many years on, on the reputation. And then when the Japanese started beating them, it was like, uh-oh. Yeah, what are we and gonna then, do? Yeah, and now, the, the, you know, and a lot of that still lingers. You know, you have a whole generation that goes, I'm not buying an American car. Right. But you know, to me, I think it's equal to anything that's out there. I mean, I think General Motors is all engineers now. And that's oh what, yeah. That's yep. what I love about it. I mean, 
And there's no one else in the world can build a Corvette for $65,000. No. And do it in a union shop. Right. Using quality product. Because, you know, when I think came out, I thought, oh, it's going to have some torque converter transmission that'll have a steel frame with some carbon pieces hanging on. No. No, they, it's all magnesium and the double clutch transmission. Yeah, this, the C8's definitely, oh. definitely a beautiful car. Yeah, I drove the Z06, and that was really impressive. Yeah. You know there's an electric Corvette coming too. That's oh yeah, there's an electric everything coming. I know, I know. That's the scary part. It's like, unfortunately for me, like I'm a mechanic by trade, so I, I'm have not. Work for I'm the gonna have. Yeah. I'm gonna have to learn it and work on it before I can retire. Yeah, but you'll have work for the rest <laughs> of your life. Oh yeah, as long as long as the government doesn't crack down on, or you know, ridiculously on the ice engines, it's I'll be fine. But well, I don't think any. You know, I think it actually saves ice engines. Because you can't can build it, you can't continue to have what are there 15 billion cars on the phone? some crazy thing yeah like how that. are you gonna you can't get rid of no. them all at once <laughs> that's right but the idea being I, I think it's like the horse horse is now for recreation right and they're well taken care of right I mean you use your electric car during the week to go to work and you take your, your old car for the weekend yeah your Ferrari or or this or anything sure. out on, on the weekend you zip around the hills and sure that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, and, and, and then guys like yourself become specialists. You're not just a mechanic now. You're a specialist, and, right. and people come to you because they have one of these, right. you know? So I think it's all good, actually. Yeah. You know, I work with uh, McPherson College once in a while, and, uh, you know, they turn out these qualified mechanics. This is the only country in the world to be a mechanic, you say. I'm a mechanic, <laughs> and you're right. a mechanic. Right, right. You know, you go to Germany or something, you, where's your certificate? Yeah, let's see what you have. You're, <laughs> you know, and when you graduate from McPherson, you get a certificate in automobile registry. It's a four-year program you learn. Right. Uh, magnetos and paint sure. body and, you know, and, you know, original materials and all kinds of things like that. Sure. So it's, it's really exciting. So it's, and we live in an era now where nobody works their hands anymore. So you wind up making really good money. Right. Like when I was a kid, everybody pretended to know about cars because it was part of the culture. Now you have kids that know nothing, but the kids that know stuff really know yep. stuff. I mean, I meet 18, 19 year old guys, and it's just unbelievable, especially right. when it comes to the electronics and all that stuff. Right. You know, I like driving this thing. It's actually it's very good. Yeah, it's a it's a fun little you know weekend car. Um, it, it can go toe to toe with a with a lot of cars from its same time era. Um, you know, it, like I said, there's there's lots of articles on them how these things could go to the drag strip and beat on the 5 0 Mustangs with no, you know, no problem whatsoever. Yeah, that's funny. A quarter mile. And when did Oldsmobile fall? Is it, is uh, it I believe it was 2004. It's, a, it's not 2004 or 2005. So it's almost 20 years. Already. Yep. Wow. Yeah, time time definitely flies. But this was this was the last um, W Series performance car that Oldsmobile had. Um, after this, they ran the same package. W41 performance package on the old Zachiva, um, which was the um, pre, you know the next car in line for the end body. Right. And uh, they produced about um, 16, 1700 of those between 92, 93, and then that was it. W Series was dead and gone. <laughs> so you're a Chevy mechanic by trade. Correct. Right? Yep. So what what uh, bonded you, so to speak, with Oldsmobile? Did your dad have one? Or so the... well, my so my dad, and my grandfather. GM by family. That's right. you know that's what I was growing up into. Um, this particular car, what it's not so much Oldsmobile because I'm a fan of Oldsmobile, but I don't own really any other model of Oldsmobile besides the Calais. Right. I got several of these. Um, but what drew, really drew me to this was that um, when I was going through college, learning learning the trade and whatnot, um, I don't know much about carburetors. I can I can set a you know a bowl and whatnot get it running but I don't I don't know how to take one apart and put it back together right the fuel injected stuff is what I learned on and uh, this being as primitive as it is um, was something I could relate to and I, I knew how to work on so um, when I started when you, I was maybe 17 and 18 and you start digging for you right. know oh what's a cool car to have I had I had Honda CRX's I've had Honda Prelude stuff right. like that but um, you go to the car show you know car shows up by us and there's a handful of those at each one this car here any car show I go to, I have the only one, and that's yeah. what I—that's what I love about it. That's funny. Yeah. 
because I only get two reactions at car shows. What is that? Or I haven't seen one in 25 years. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, I just finished a, uh, well, a little while ago, a Firebird Sprint, the six-cylinder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, I saw, with, saw with, it. With the power up, yep. with the, you know, the four-barrel, the headers. Yep. And I love that thing. It's great. I mean, it's not the fastest thing out there. Right. But it's just so but different. But it's unique in its own way. And even Pontiac guys go, what is, what's that? What's that motor out of? It's Pontiac. <laughs> Nah, -uh. you get that. No, no, it's a Pontiac. really. Yeah. It says Pontiac. Well, look, it's right on it. Right. You know, you know, it's just especially 70s, 80s. Everybody you had V8itis. You know, if it's not a V8. <laughs> that was the thing with my with my Sprint because by the time you got through with the high performance options, you could have had a V8 with 400 right. horsepower. You know. Yeah, th this thing, 190 horsepower and a 2,500 pound chassis is. What's this car weigh about? 30 it's about, 20, about 2,500 pounds. It's only 2,500? Really? Yep. yep. Well, I guess you don't, have, you don't have any safety equipment or any of that. <laughs> no, there's no no airbags. <laughs> Although Oldsmobile was the first car to have airbags, yep. I remember. Yep. I remember an episode of 60 Minutes where some lady got in an accident and the airbag went off. And she, she bought a used car and it was a a pilot car experimenting with airbags and it <laughs> saved her life. Right. And they did a whole thing about it on 60 Minutes. So nice. I don't find really any harshness here. It seems all right. Yeah, I mean, it's to each their own. I guess that that's what's n notably killed this motor. Um, GM, in 1995, GM continued to produce this as a, as a 2.4 liter, right. but it had a balancing shaft assembly built yeah. into the oil pump. Right. to take a little bit of uh, what people were complaining about out of the engine. Right. But with that comes less horsepower. They were they were about 150 to 160 horsepower. And that's fifth gear. You're going about 60 miles an hour, 2300 RPM. That's not bad. Yeah, it gets, uh, I've done a couple. Uh, we went to Watkins Glen track opening this year. I yeah. took this car um, at the end of February. And surprisingly, I got almost 36 miles to the gallon on a trip there and back. So Wow. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, I was really surprised. I drove there on a full tank. I stopped and got fuel, did my math, beat the crap out of it on the racetrack for two laps, and uh, then got gas on the ride home. And it was, I, I was really surprised. And this is stock suspension. Yep, this is stock suspension. It's it's not bad at all. Uh, not it's not bad for seventy six thousand miles. It's right. uh, it could be stiffer, you know, when right. it was new. But yeah, they can they can handle a corner surprisingly well. You get on the yeah. on the throughway on and off. And G, GM put a lot of thought into they they took a lot of information from the race teams on the tire size they were going to put on this thing. Right. So it's got nice wide wide two fifteen sixties on it. Um, so you got got a lot of contact surface on the road. And what happened to this motor? They just shelved it, right? It didn't continue on into the 2000s, did it? No. The, the 2.4 liter variant of it um, ran up until, uh, I believe 2002 would have been the last year you oh, could okay. get it um, in a cab, I believe it was a Cavalier, and then they phased out to the Ecotec engine. Yeah, that's when they got my aerial out of it. Yep. But this engine here was GM's first, first true full in-house dual overhead cam, four cylinder engine. It likes to rev. Oh yeah. I'm always down a gear because I want to hear it rev. <laughs> Another thing that was kind of unique about these things is you have your traditional, you know, um, rack and pinion right. mounted to the cradle. Right. These are actually mounted up on the firewall and the tie rods actually connect just below the spring on the struts. So the steering is, is way higher up than most anything else. I don't get any torque steer with it, nope. though. I mean, the Italians always used to say you can't put more than 200 horsepower through the front wheels or else you reel over the place. <laughs> but the Oldsmobile did it with 375 horse with the Tornado. Right. Back in 91, GM was mostly front wheel, wasn't it? Yeah. They were just getting... Cadillac, the late, Tornado. late 80s, yeah. they were just getting into phasing out rear wheel going in the front yeah. wheel pretty much every platform yeah uh, obviously you know chevy's caprice ran into the mid 90s rear wheel right. drive um but other than that um you know I, I think cadillac side maybe the elante that was still rear wheel drive yeah but most of their economy um compact cars 
uh, the end body, the W body, stuff like that, um, was going front wheel drive. I mean, this seems like it would be an awful lot of fun to throw around this track. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I haven't had the opportunity to, to take my race car to a track day. It's, it's on my list of things to do, but um, no doubt I, I, that thing can put down some solid laps anywhere yeah. you're going to take it. You know, I like this thing. It's, you know, sometimes feeling fast is as fun as being fast. Right. Because it's not really fast by any modern definition of no. fast. But it's, it's a pleasant exhaust note, at least to me it is. Yeah. Uh, the engine sounds like it's working. You know, it seems, it gives effort while seeing effortless, if that right. makes any sense. Yep. So, I mean, you put your foot in it and you, you know, you enjoy watching the pack move across and your red line is almost seven grand. It's which about 6,800. Yeah, 6,800, which is pretty amazing. I always want to be down one gear because it feels like when it's on the pot, that's when it's, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you put a turbo on this, you could probably get 215 or something out of it. So, funny, the turbo GM had a Cutlass Supreme with a turbo model, um, an experimental engine like this, right. uh, with the 2.3 liter, and it was uh, the Indianapolis 500 pace car, right. I believe 1988. Yeah. Um, and that one, the specs they gave out on that engine was 250 horsepower with a single turbo on it. Oh, okay. So, Well, GM was the first to turbocharge a car. Yeah, the uh, Jetfire, right? The Jetfire yep. and the Corvette. They threw rocks at Corvair, each other. Yeah. They did. Yeah. But, but they both came <laughs> about the same time. I think the Corvair was more popular. Yeah. The Jetfire, what, turbo, what, what, what is that? <laughs> Corvair didn't require any extra juice, right? The jet fire needed right. special fluid. Right, the rocket, yeah, yeah, that yeah. was there. Yeah. <laughs> I love that car too. Yep. I'd never heard of that before I met him. I know, isn't that funny? And you're a GM guy. Yep. <laughs> I used to think the Corvair was the most European GM car. <laughs> but this actually feels like, uh, you know, a rabbit or one of those. Uh, a little bit. Well, it runs very nicely. Being a mechanic has its advantages because this thing runs terrific. Oh, yeah. Able to know, know your upkeep. Well, Jeff, thanks for bringing this piece of GM history here. I, I'm always glad when I learned something I didn't know. I think I knew this at one point, but it just went out of my head. I, as, we, as we discussed the Aerotech, I remember following that, and then one day it just seemed to sort of disappear, and I wonder what happened to it. Well, this is what happened to it. And, uh, <laughs> it's an impressive car, you know? I really, it's it's such, this is the ultimate sleeper. It just looks like, not to be insulting, a rent-a-car. Right. You know, it's something you pick up at the airport, okay. And I would love to pick this up at the airport. I would have a great time in the airport. <laughs> they don't know what they had. Thank you, my friend. No problem. Appreciate Much appreciated. It. So, it's my hey. pleasure. So stay tuned. We'll have some more Oldsmobile lessons somewhere down the road. Somebody else will show up with something I never heard of. <laughs> and please do. I can't wait. Thanks, you guys. See you later. Mm-hmm. <laughs>